Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, we will be celebrating women in history during this Ask the Expert event with the president of the Massachusetts Historical Society, Catherine Algor. I'm Yeti Bay Evans, creative producer for the animated series, Molly of Denali, and I will be your GBH host for this afternoon's event. Thanks so much to everyone that's joining us today, including our leadership circle and the Ralph Lowell Society members. We appreciate your continued and generous support. Before we get started, I would just like to say a friendly reminder that unlike us, you won't be able to be on video and we won't be able to hear you or see you, but we do want to know all your questions. If you have something you want to ask our expert, you have to open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type it in. As always, we would love to know where you're tuning in from. So when you submit your question, please be sure to let us know where you're watching the event. And if you see a question that you wanna hear the answer to, be sure to give it a thumbs up and it will go to the top of the Q&A. In order to turn on the closed captioning feature, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Two transcription display options will pop up. We recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript. A sidebar window will open up where you can see what the speaker is saying. Please bear in mind that closed captioning may be slightly delayed. And without further ado, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce Catherine Algor. As president of the Massachusetts Historical Society, Catherine Algor is a noted historian, nonprofit leader, and public history innovator. Previously, she was the Nadine and Robert Scotheim Director of Education at the Huntington Library in San Marino, California and a former professor of history at the and UC presidential chair at the University of California, Riverside. She began her teaching career at Simmons College and has been a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study and a visiting professor of history at Harvard University. Her first book, Parlor Politics, in which the ladies of Washington helped build a city and a government, won the James H. Brossard First Book Prize from the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic and the Northeast Popular Culture American Culture Association Annual Book Award. Her political biography, A Perfect Union, Dolly Madison and the Creation of the American Nation was a finalist for the George Washington Book Prize. In 2012, she published Dolly Madison, The Problem of National Unity, and the Queen of America, Mary Cutts, Life of Dolly Madison. Catherine Algor also serves on the board of directors of the National Women's History Museum, the executive board of the Organization of American Historians, and is a member of the Gilder Lerman Scholarly Advisory Board. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Welcome. Thank you, Yeti Bay. That was a lovely introduction. Of course, you forgot my most important credential. I am a GBH member. So yes. you know. <laughs> that's quite important. <laughs> Just put that in the end. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much again. Um, it's a pleasure to get to talk to you today. And I'd like to start off our questions this afternoon with wondering why we don't know more about women's history. Ah, I wonder if that's a really polite way of saying, why should we care about women's history? <laughs> um, uh, and maybe I can answer both the polite question and, and the real question. Um, the, the really short answer about why I'm a historian of women's lives and gender is that we look at women's lives and words and work in the past, because if we don't, we don't know stuff. How's that for pretty basic? So if we mm. just pay attention to the words and work and lives of the men in a culture, we just, and it's not even like we're missing half the story, we're missing, uh, we're getting a very skewed story. Um, and why many of our audience, I can imagine, didn't take women's history courses in high school or college. Um, that's a longer story. And in fact, I hate to tell you, it starts with the ancient Greeks. 
So we're going to go back to ancient Greece, but I swear we'll be for just like a minute. <laughs> uh, well, actually, we're going to go back to the cavemen, even worse. Whoa. But, because the truth is storytelling, uh, and that would include stories of the past or whatever you happen, happen to. I'm sure the cavemen and women, you know, sat around the fire doing that. History as a discipline, which is really the stories about the past that we use in the present to answer questions or to gain knowledge. So that's different from just stories. These are stories with a purpose. That really starts in ancient Greece and it's all about war. Hmm. So it's all about, let's go back and recreate this battle. And if it worked, we'll do that again. And if it didn't work, we won't do that again. It was as simple as that. Um, but then um, over the centuries, see, we didn't stay there too long. Uh, over the centuries, that's really what history with a capital H was. It was um, a narrative of the most obvious kinds of coercive power. So it was stories of wars and battles and kings and presidents. Um, and that was true right up until sort of mid, the mid 20th century. Now, even as I'm saying this, that history with a capital H is war and soldiers and presidents and kings, there were always moments where women tried to enter that space, even telling stories about women. So in 1405, an Italian noblewoman named Christine de Pizan published a book called uh, The Book of the City of Ladies. And this was, this was her thing. She got really tired of hearing in her culture, this is the you know, early the 15th century here, that women were bad, that they were morally weaker than men, that they were physically weaker, that they were not as brave and they were not as intelligent. She was tired of hearing that. So her solution was she said, I'm gonna to put together a book and I'm gonna share stories of women of the past who are brave and intelligent and moral and all that. And that'll get rid of sexism. <laughs> okay, so that didn't work anyway, it didn't work. But the point is there was that impulse, what Gerda Lerner, the mother of women's history calls that feminist impulse to assert women's humanity or equality with, with men. And again, there are these moments as we sort of move through to modernity in the Western world where we see things like our very own homegirl in Boston, Mercy Otis Warren, uh, actually, in addition to being a, a very active in the American Revolution itself, she's a pamphleteer, she writes plays, um, she's very uh, a, a real voice in the American Revolution. In 1805, she actually writes one of the very first um, histories of the American Revolution. So. Uh, so we have these examples all the way through of women wanting to either talk about women or trying to basically do the real history talk like a man. Now, I've got you up to the mid 20th century. Can I can I keep going? Sure, please. OK, <laughs> so what happens in the mid 20th century is that history, the capital H, undergoes a transformation and it starts in Europe and it comes to America. And it's called the new history or the new social history. And the driving impetus behind the new history was that maybe instead of just looking at kings and battles and wars, we look at ordinary people. And we wonder what they ate and how they lived, how they lived in villages. We looked at, started looking at religion. And so it was this new history that started to look at a world beyond that world of coercive power. Now, half of those ordinary people were women. That is actually statistically true. And so they suddenly became kind of swept up in, you know, if you're gonna study a village, right? And you're gonna do a micro history of Dedham, um, mm -hmm. which exists, very good, by the way, um, you're gonna look at women. Um, and something else was changing though in the world after the war and America. So in America until the fifties or so, there were very few people that got to go to college. Most of them were very elite white men. But after the war, World War II, the GI Bill brought white men of many classes and backgrounds into the academy. So just as we're starting to look at ordinary people, ordinary people are coming in and they're taking courses and they're becoming professors. And then in the 50s and 60s, people of color came in and with the women's movement, women of all classes and races come into the academy. And so it's all of these new people. And if history is saying, I wanna go back to the past to answer some questions, these people had a ton of questions. And it's really in those very early days of the 70s, like late 60s, early 70s, that women's history becomes an academic subject. 
So it becomes, in, in other words, real. So it's not just something yeah. that some lady does over here or there, but it becomes part of the academy. It becomes part of history with the rigorous uh, standards of that history demands as far as evidence and argument. Now, I if you look at those dates yeah. for a lot of our, our folks, you can see why they didn't maybe have women's history courses in college. <laughs> Exactly. Um, thank you so much for just giving that wealth of history of, um, you know, how we haven't been a part of um, his story, as it were. And in Indigenous societies, like from my culture, I'm Alaska Native, and I'm zooming in from Alaska this morning. Um, we have followed a matrilineal history and lineage, and we ha also have an oral history and so our histories have also included a lot of the wars, um, but also a lot of our ways of life and way of being and the storytelling, as, as you mentioned in the beginning, as a part of like a collective society. And I think it's just really interesting to consider, you know, written documentation as well as oral history and um, the importance of remembering and utilizing both as we proceed forward. Uh, I have one more question that I want to ask you, and then I'm going to open it up um, to take some of these questions that we have in the Q&A tab. But I'm wondering, what is coverture? Oh, it's my, it's my new thing now. This is my goal is that every American knows what coverture is. But I want to just remark a little bit on what you talk about from the indigenous culture. And what's so interesting is in that oral tradition, because it concentrated not just on wars, but everyday life, it preceded the new history, right? Because when you're talking about everyday life, you're talking about how, how ordinary people do things. And what's interesting about the other I'd like to remark on is the fact that women were present in those narratives. Yes. Why are women not present in narratives? Well, that could be because of the culture they come from. And that brings us to coverture. Okay. <laughs> coverture, Thank which you. we can put it in the chat, but it's like overture with C. So coverture <laughs> is um, a legal a framework that uh, has been in, was in British law for centuries. Also, there's a Spanish version and a French version. And of course, when colonists came from Britain, they came, brought coverture with them during the colonial era. And coverture held that no female person who was presumed, by the way, to be a wife had a legal identity. So she was covered from mm -hmm. birth by her father and then by her husband. And as a symbol of that, she never really has a name. So when she becomes covered by her husband, her husband's name becomes her and there's one legal entity, that's the husband and she is covered under that. Now, what that means is she owns nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, does Not even the clothes on her back. She does not own her labor. So her husband can send her out um, and, and collect wages for her labor. She doesn't own her children. So if her husband deserts her or divorces her or whatever, she can lose her children because they are owned by him. Of course, she can't make a contract. She cannot have her own money. It was a very onerous legal system. And we could talk more about it because I'm sure somebody in that audience has more questions. Because the truth is, this is a, I'm talking about a legal structure. In real life, things played out differently because real life has its own you know, emphasis. But the big story that I want all Americans to know is that in the 1770s, we're getting ready to do an American revolution. And the founders are really clear that we are going to create a whole new world. And it's going to be a world turned upside down and authority is going to be in question. It's going to be a modern world. They kept coverture. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> they kept it. They kept it. And then when they, they decided they needed a constitution and they went and they just gave us a bang up constitution that's going to last till now. They kept coverture. And then through the late 1700s, early 1800s, when cities and states and towns are redoing law and becoming modern and pulling away from British models and creating black letter law as opposed to equity law, they kept coverture. Mm -hmm. And the first break in coverture comes in 1848. It's a very small break. We can talk about what that is. But we, the American public, we have never gotten rid of it. So we have picked away at coverture. Uh, so that we can do lots of things. I can have my own money and, you know, make a contract and I can keep my name when I get married. 
But there are things that um, are still in our legal system that stop us. If you've ever tried to file your income taxes under your own name and not your husband, you've run into it. You tried to um, you know, have a loan and you needed your husband to co-sign, couldn't get a credit card. I know there are people out there in the audience who couldn't get a credit card in the 60s, that's coverture. And uh, I was kind of astonished, and then I'll wrap it up, but I was kind of astonished oh, to discover, you know, I'm, I'm reading about this in the 2000s. And I'm like, well, how do you get rid of coverture? How do you do it? And the answer, it turns out that equal rights amendment, which frankly, I'd forgotten all about, but mm -hmm. it's the way to get rid of coverture. So that is, that is my uh, hobby horse these days. So thank you for indulging me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up equal rights because as you were speaking, I'm you know just reminded of uh, one of our great civil rights activists here in Alaska. Her name's Elizabeth Paratrovich. And um, before she stood up in 1945 for our rights as Alaska Native people, um, we were not allowed to enter into the same buildings as um, non-Native people. And in order to vote at that time, we actually had to bring somebody who was not Native to verify that we'd given up our culture, our language, our way of being, just to vote. And she stood up for our rights in the territorial legislature at the time. And thankfully, the first Anti-Discrimination Act was uh, signed into play uh, by Governor Gruning at the time. And it just is amazing, as you said, like, even though we were trying in the American Revolution to really turn things up upside down and you know, uh, question authority, there was a lot of authority um, brought into our new America and also in with uh, colonization as we, um, you know, went through and forward with the westward expansion movement. Um, I really appreciate just this wealth of information and I, I'm learning so much from you so far, but we have some more questions and I don't want to be the only one asking them today. Uh, we have so many guests joining us. And one of the questions that we have um, that has got quite a few likes is from Nicole and she is asking or she's sharing in the beginning that I am a female veteran and a member of the American Legion on Bunker Hill. I learned of their history of Elizabeth O'Donnell, a World War I yeoman in the Charleston Navy Yard and how the mayor of Boston in 1934 didn't want her to be the chief marshal of the veterans parade. I'm trying to learn more about her. Where could I start my research on her? Okay, it's Nicole, is it? Yes. All right, everybody's gonna think I paid Nicole $25 to ask that question, but <laughs> I have a great answer. And as, um, as Yeti Bay said, I am Catherine Algor, the president of the Massachusetts Historical Society. We're in downtown Boston at 1154 Boylston Street. We are free and open to the public. We have an amazing collection, two and a half presidential libraries, 14 million items, a lot of famous stuff, but a lot of the kind of papers of ordinary folks that we're talking about. And we have a staff of professional reference librarians who, Nicole, they are just sitting there and waiting for you to come in. Um, they can steer you through our collection, but they can also help you find where the other sources might be because what you need are the primary sources. And those are the pieces of the past from the past. That's great. Yes, I'm so glad. And hopefully Nicole will be able to um, come come there in person and Absolutely. or find information online. And I should also add, we're, we do have a presence online. We have a catalog online. You can um, call a reference librarian. You can even do that thing that you do when you're shopping, the e-chat. We can e-chat. So she doesn't have to come into the building on Boylston Street, but it is beautiful. So I should say that. That's so great. Not only are you sharing history, but you have the modern technology to help us <laughs> understand and learn it. That's wonderful. Absolutely, yeah. So just going a little bit back to what you mentioned before, um, they're asking, we have a guest, Emily, who has asked um, that you mentioned a date of 1848 uh, and what happened. Um, and you mentioned it with great enthusiasm. So <laughs> if you could share with us what happened. Yeah. yeah, listen, the enthusiasm is completely out of proportion because really it's not going to be that radical, but something happened, Emily. So um as I mentioned, coverture was this very strict legal framework and it was very rigid, right? And so um, 
the truth is it, it just couldn't last through life. So there were all kinds of weird exceptions and practices and people ignored it and when they wanted to. And here was one of the problems. Let's say you were a woman and, and you your father was rich. So you're the daughter of a rich man and he doesn't like who you married. Just thought maybe he was, you know, like my theory about the guy in the Gilded Age rakes. I think he's gonna be just trouble, right? Well, you don't want your daughter marrying him and now he has, technically, legally, control over anything she has. So men of wealth set up um, instruments that allowed uh, what they were gonna leave their daughters or their grandchildren to pass through. The, wouldn't, the woman wouldn't own it, but it would pass through her to her children. And these were safeguards. They were also pretty handy at uh, hiding money. So if you were afraid that you were going into a risky investment, um, you could hide your money you know, under one of these covered devices. Well, what happened by the 1840s, now remember this is after the sort of democratic surge, regular ordinary white men wanted that privilege as well. They wanted their women to ha have the ability to you know, own or control um, property. And so in 1848, New York State passed the Married Woman's Property Acts, which gave women some ownership in the marital assets. New York was, I think, a leader there. Other states followed. So it sounds, Emily, it sounds better than it is because it's not really like acknowledging she's a full person or a legal person. It was just giving ordinary white men kind of this little device that elites had used. But let me tell you something, people reacted because it was a break in coverture and it was sort of like, you do this and who knows what's gonna happen. It's the slippery slope. <laughs> yeah, the good old Thanks. slippery slope. Right. Thank goodness I didn't live in that era. I, I don't know if I probably would have gotten a lot of trouble. <laughs> oh, I, I would have been a mess. <laughs> That's great. We have another question coming in from Tara and she's asking, can you speak a little about the ERA and the fact that I believe it is still not officially passed, still waiting for a couple of states to agree? I'm curious how many actually know that? Yeah. And you know, this is one of those up to the minute things. If I'd known you were going to ask that, I should have looked it up. Um, what happened with the ERA, it, was, it, it gained a lot of momentum in the 70s. And it got to a very, uh, very, it got to a place where I think there was only just a few states, maybe three left that had to ratify. And basically the clock stopped. Um, and it just sat idle for a long time. And it's only been, this is why I'm saying this probably I should say I'm not a journalist, I'm a historian. So this happened too recently for me to know. But we actually got to the point where we got the final number of states. I think Virginia was the last to pass it. So now we have the, 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 the number of states needed to pass the ERA. But the question is, do those votes count because the clock, can we extend the clock? And I think that's where we are right now. Um, speaking as a historian and as a person who lived through the 70s, I sort of forgot about the ERA because it did stall. Obviously, there wasn't an appetite for it. Um, and when I was studying coverture and I was looking at all the ways that coverture took away a person's personhood, and I had realized that there was that this was a kind of legal slavery that was very akin to the slavery that was based on race in America. In fact, there's a scholar's theory um, that the reason our um, system of slavery in the Americas was so total and immutable and lifelong and inherited and so absolute was because marriage was the model. Hmm. But how do, you, how do you cure that? But the right. answer is exactly what you did for race-based slavery. It took three amendments to, to, to at least deal legally, and I'm not talking about real life now, but legally to deal with uh, the status of enslaved persons. And that's why I suddenly looked up and went, why don't we have a constitutional amendment? Oh yes, that's that ERA. So it's still important because we have to be able to state that women are legal beings with destinies of their own. And <laughs> we have a lot to say and contribute to society for sure. We don't contribute to society. We contribute, we, um, we constitute it. We constitute right? it. That's it's great. It's not. It's not someone else's society that we're bringing the brownies to, right? I love that. It's a society that we are we are crafting actively. Um, so yeah, creating it. Yes, that's so good. Thank you, Catherine. 
Uh, we have another question coming in from Mary, and she's asking, how do you see the pushback against minority women's history writing, for example, against the 1619 project interrupting the progress of women's her story? Yes. Oh, by the way, thank you, Deb, for giving us information in the chat. Um, somebody, somebody's on it. Sweet. Um, you know, this is why it's a justice issue. And, and this is why we should care about women's history and care about women, even if we aren't any of them. Um, because it's just the, the pushback against 1619 is part of a much larger um, pushback all around that we're seeing with pushing back on voting rights, on LGBTQI uh, people. Uh, it's just part of that. The truth is what, um, uh, so sorry, I've forgotten her name. Isn't that terrible? Um, the author of 1619 Project, okay. uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Thank you. I'm <laughs> sorry, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Um, you know, she is a journalist and she did what uh, good historians uh, teach their students to do. She went and she st studied the books of my colleagues, right? So these people who have been working for 20, 30, 40 years on narratives of American history that are based in class, race, gender, sexualities, and abilities, she basically said, what are these smart people saying? What does American history look like? And then she wrote it as a basically a, a great dissertation for the rest of us. So I look back at that and I think people are attacking her because she's just a journalist. Well, she did the right thing. She went to the historians and, and, and looked at actual evidence and arguments. Right, yeah, that's so important. See, yeah, and so I just see the pushback against her as, you know, I think she's of course astonished about the reaction, of course. Um, and had she published this 10 years ago, I don't know that it would have been the same, but we just live in a very different time. Yes, uh, thank you for mentioning that. And you know, I was just thinking when you were speaking about going to the historians, going to the educated you know, resources, it's so important in, today, uh, in today's world because there's so much misinformation out there, especially with the internet. And if you aren't, you know, going to accurate sources to obtain your information, you can lead yourself askew, which is unfortunate and develop some wild opinions out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's why I, I always will stand up for historians. Sometimes we're boring. I get it. <laughs> no, but, and, we have a, and we have a lot of footnotes, Yeti Bay, a lot of footnotes. <laughs> yes. but the point is we have rules and our rules are, are, are that we can't say anything unless it is supported. Uh, by evidence. And there's shades to that. And there are ways of using common sense as well. But we don't get to make stuff up. Right. <laughs> yes. Many people do nowadays, especially yes. with social media. <laughs> well, thank you. I have another question um, before we go into a quick break. This one's coming from Helen. And she is asking, what about the idea that women are were inferior to men using biology and science to back up the theory that women as well as blacks are inferior to white men? Yeah. Hi, Helen May in California. Um, yes. So uh, this is a this is a great topic. So women had always, as you saw from Christine de in 1405, mm -hmm. that there was always this structure set up where women were considered because they were physically weak, obviously physically weaker, they were considered uh, less moral, uh, less intelligent, and less, 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 less. And that was backed up by, you know, whatever their version of science is. What's interesting by the 19th century, where, the, by the way, the conception of women changes, now women are more moral and seen as pious and domestic creatures. Um, there was a movement to use the new science, which was based on blood, it was based on the shape of one's head, to ratify the power structure. And so Black people, um, people with intellectual disabilities, and women of all classes and races all get lumped in to this group of inferior beings, and the science was put to that. Um, and it was what we would now call junk science. It wasn't good. <laughs> What's serious about that though, is that there's an echo of that. So we don't hear about this so much, but 10, 15 years ago, a lot of studies about brains, right? And mm -hmm. women's brains and girls' brains and boys' brains. And then we started learning stuff about brains and maybe that actually wasn't really working, but I'm still saying that there's still an impulse in science to try to differentiate as though we're gonna find some biological silver bullet with gender. 
And I have to say a great book, it was written about 20 years ago, but still good, called Sexual Science by Cynthia Russett is about this movement in the 19th century to keep uh, using race and gender to keep uh, people in their place. Yeah, <laughs> science is an interesting part of our lives. And I um, have done quite a bit of um, educating myself within science. I was going for a medical degree. And so I've taken a lot of biology and chemistry and physics and all of the things. And um, as I've, you know, come away from the education world and, you know, been in a career world and um, putting all the puzzle pieces together, finding out that a lot of the older science, as you mentioned, is junk science. And it's some of the stuff that folks still sometimes have in the records in the back of their mind. And I'm so grateful that we continue to pursue, you know, knowledge and understanding of our of our world, of ourselves, of all the beings that we are a part of um, in this world. And uh, we're always growing. And I love that we can be lifelong learners and not just, you know, stay with one mode of education for years and years. <laughs> well, on that note, and I know we have to take a break in just a bit. I have another book to recommend. It's a more yes. recent book. It's called After Identity, Rethinking Race, Sex and Gender. And it's written by a woman named Warnke, W-A-R-N-K-E, Georgia Warnke, who is actually, you know, she's a philosopher. Oh, wow. Okay. But it, it, but it talks a lot about the use of science in uh, uh, race, gender, and sex. So This is great. You're adding to my book list. I've committed <laughs> myself to nine this year. And, uh, or well, nine so far this year, I should say. But I'm wanting to go for 20. Good. And Good. <laughs> so... I'm looking forward to checking these books out as well. Thank you so much. We have time for just one more question before we go to break. This one will have to be um, kind of quick. It might be difficult though. So I'm going to pick um, ex expediently a question. In the weaker vessel, Antonia Frazier talks about the 15th century widows. Widows are in control of their own money. They can also work in their husband's field as their widow. Can you speak more to this? Yes, and a coverture uh, sort of accounted for widows. Um, so with, there was a place for widows um, in coverture. But what's most interesting, and this was also true in, in Antonio, the world that Antonio Frazier about, is that in legal and political theory, all women are presumed to be wives. In John Locke, in Rousseau, in everybody's, it's that women can only be dealt with legally as wives. The fact that there are actually people who don't marry and who are also a widow are, are dealt with as an anomaly, as, a, as a, um, a null case. So they do account for them, but they're not part of the whole thing because a woman is a wife. How's that for an expedient answer? That's great. I love it. And, you know, I, I grew up with, you know, wanting to be married and have all, you know, the whole nine yards of a family and everything. And I, and I had that for a, quite a while. I have four sons. I was married 18 years. Oh. And um, now I'm like, well, I've, you know, this is an interesting conundrum I'm in. Um, and that is not my, my ideal from, you know, childhood. And I'm like, it is okay. My life is okay. I am, you know, in a career, I'm, I'm a single mother supporting my children, I own my own home, and I'm a, you know, productive person and a great mom and all these things. And like, yet, if I were to go back in my, in just my short lifetime, I probably would have been like, no way, you gotta, you gotta be a wife, like you, in order to be successful. Yeah. Yeti Bay, this is great about your life. We just now need a legal system to support you. I know, so, right? I, I don't know when you got your house, but <laughs> because all women are wives, I, one of my favorites, I do collect coverture in real life st stories. One of my favorites was from a woman who came up to me after a talk and she said, I'm a single woman. I went to buy a home and my mortgage was refused, even though I had a good job because I was single. And she said, wow. of course, the irony was my job was I was a loan officer for the bank. That is ridiculous. There you go. <laughs> is that now documented? Have you documented that? You all heard it. <laughs> yes, yes. It is documented and recorded in this uh, webinar. 
Uh, well, thank you so much. Um, up next, we're going to, I'm going to invite Jamie Reese, a colleague, colleague of mine from GBH, and she's going to share a few words with us all. Thank you, Jamie. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. And uh, hello, everyone at home. We're so glad you could join us during today's Ask the Expert event. Now, most of us know that March is Women's History Month, and to celebrate, GBH and the World Channel proudly present programs and events that provide a deeper understanding of women's contributions to the United States and to the world. Now, if you value GBH programs and events like this one, we ask you to please consider making a donation. Today, if you are able to give $7.50 as a GBH sustaining member or $90 all at once, we will send you Rise Up Songs of the Women's Movement CD. Now this special CD compilation includes many of the songs that became empowering anthems for women during the 1960s through the mid 1980s or so. Songs include favorites like Aretha Franklin's Respect, Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive, one of my favorite songs, and uh, Cindy Lauper's Girls Just Want to Have Fun. So there's something in there for everyone to enjoy. Now, there are three ways for people to give today, and I'm going to go over those with you right now. The first thing you can do is click on the link you see in the support chat. I'm sorry, to click on the link you see in the chat tab now, which takes you to our website to make a donation. And that website is gbh.org slash support events. If texting is your preferred method, you can also text the letters GBH to 800-204-3811. So that's 800-204-3811. Or you can scan the QR code pictured behind me right over here. <laughs> and uh, that will open a donation form on your smartphone or smart device. Now this CD, as I said before, this CD offers fun and classic beats to jam out to, whether you're driving around town with your windows down and your music blaring, or just dancing around in your living room. So please share your support of GBH and lifelong learning and important community conversations by giving to GBH now. We're here for our community, but we really need our community to be here for us. If you're already a member, we want you to know that we sincerely appreciate your support. Yes. So that's my message. Thanks, everyone. Like I said, you're going to love this CD. I love it. And I hope you do too. Thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, we really appreciate everybody again who has joined us today and your continued and generous support. And I am so grateful that. Um, I'm part of the GBH family with Molly of Denali, which is one of the animated series on uh, GBH that we produce. And uh, we get to share the story of Molly Mabray, who is helping young women all over learn about, you know, positive identity, being adventurous, being curious, going outside, being a part of her indigenous culture and just experiencing the world from her perspective. And I think it fits right in with our topic today. And if you're interested, you can see a link to, to Molly of Donnelly right there in the chat, which is awesome. Thanks so much, Julia, for posting that. And Catherine, we have a ton of questions that have just been flooding in here. Um, we have one that is from Laura. And she is um, asking, speaking of the American Revolution, not uh, undoing coverture, can you talk a little about John Adams' somewhat caustic response to Abigail's famous request that he and other members of the Continental Congress remember the ladies in drawing up the new laws of the country? That, well, that's my sweet spot because, <laughs> as I mentioned, we have uh, two and a half presidential libraries. I like to say we have two and a half libraries of presidential families and one of them is the Adams family. 
Um, and of course, uh, that it that acknowledges that it's not just John and John Quincy, but Adam uh, Abigail and uh, Louise Catherine and, and the other members of the family. And this is probably the most famous letter. Uh, we once had a March Madness um, bracket thing uh, about what was everybody's favorite. This emerges, number one. And this wow. is a letter that Abigail Adams wrote to John Adams in 1776 in June, so right before the 4th of July, because they're working on this Declaration of Independence thing. And she <laughs> asks him to remember the ladies. And what's interesting about that letter is it's so well known. You can buy, you know, uh, tote bags and t-shirts with it on. Everybody thinks she's talking about voting rights, but that is actually not true. Voting is was not even sort of on her radar. It wasn't something a lot of people did, but she was asking for something more radical. She was asking in this very famous letter for, as Laura says, for a cessation of coverture. She says, you know, men will be tyrants if they could, you know, be generous with us. You know, take your ancestors were not generous to us, be generous to us. And, and, do, and basically take care of us in some way by either getting rid of coverture or alleviating it. Well, it really is a, an amazing letter. It's ahead of its time. And John Adams just kind of laughed at it. So his reply to her, he just thinks she's very saucy. And he says, oh, basically he says, oh, you girls, you don't need laws when you have the despotism of the petticoat. Um, nature has given you uh, so much nature, meaning sexuality, that the law is powerless against your power, which, you know, is really kind of a jerky thing to say, considering that one of the, you know, one of the problems with coverture is that you don't actually own your own body, right? So you, I, I mentioned labor and I mentioned your children, you don't have ownership. You also didn't, uh, couldn't consent to sex in marriage, right? So coverture gave your husband complete access to your body against regardless of your will. But what's interesting, Laura, is even as he seems to poo-poo this idea, John Adams writes a little bit later to James Sullivan, who is one of the great you know, uh, thinkers around the revolution. And he writes this long tortured letter. And it's sort of like, why can't we have women? We're talking about representation. We're talking about uh, you know, doing a revolution because we're being virtually represented, but why not women? Why not propertyless men? And he basically argues all the way through this letter back and forth about why they, they, they should include women and men without property and why they can't, they just can't. And I have to tell you, it takes a lot to stymie John Adams. <laughs> but at the end of this letter, he's like, we cannot give women full political power because we just can't. <laughs> so I, by the way, I'm paraphrasing. As a historian, I feel right. like I'm paraphrasing here for comic effect. So what's <laughs> interesting about the letter is that Abigail's letter it gets dismissed by him. He sort of flirts with her through it, but it got him thinking enough that he was disturbed in his mind. So, and I think that's you know one of the amazing things that we have. You know, we're able to do. Of course, duh, we're able to communicate. We're able to com communicate in logical ways and very strategic ways in order to uh, change somebody's mind or at least get them thinking and get the wheels turning. And I think it comes through a lot of observation and a lot of um, understanding human needs and emotions and then the, the behaviors that then come from those needs and emotions from people. And as women, I think we have an incredible ability uh, and, and anybody really can do this if they learn uh, how to observe other people's emotions and then use their communication tools in order to influence and change somebody's mind. And I think there are many more people, of course, throughout history that have uh, influenced men. And um, now we get to influence and create, as you say, our society. So, you know, awesome. really to that, to that point, I noticed several of the com um questions were about education and that's what you're talking about is a, a, she had the ability she was very Abigail was very ashamed of her education she knew she actually had a better education than most men she could read and write but her spelling wasn't good and she was constantly apologizing but she was really a great writer and an education really was um so women's history is often too um full of irony so 
women were given the tools of their own emancipation, but not for them to be emancipated, but because it would serve men's purposes. So uh, we had a long tradition in the colonies of white Protestant women reading um, only because they wanted, the, the, the culture wanted them to be able to read the Bible. And they were also seen as teachers of children. And so because of that, they actually learned to read. And then in the American Revolution, um, after the revolution, there was a lot of fear in the founding generation, especially among men, about making this thing stick. I mean, it's one thing to say, yeah, we're going to you know, revolt against the king, but this new nation, is it, is it going to be a thing? And this was an era, late 1700s, early 1800s. People talked about the United States of America in the plural, right? So they wouldn't mm -hmm. say the United States of America is. They'd say the United States are, because it wasn't clear that this whole nation was going to. So they were looking, the founders, the thinkers were looking for any kind of way to adhere the nation. And they set on this idea that we call revolutionary mothers. And the idea was that if we're gonna get this thing to work, we are gonna really have to take care of our children, especially our male children and inculcate them into the kind of virtue, that was their word, uh, public virtue that you need to be a good citizen. And we better educate these women so they can do that for us. But of course, once you start teaching people to read, the genie's out of the bottle. <laughs> there, you know, and there's a reason that was illegal to teach a slave, an enslaved person to read because yeah. they knew once you start learning. And so that was one of those cases. Where, so there was, to answer some of the questions, in the early 1820s, 30s, 40s, there was a strong push for white women of the middle, middling classes or so to read it was not to make them smarter. It was not to make them better people or thinkers. It was to make them good mothers. But of course, that was just the beginning. <laughs> yes, uh, I wholeheartedly uh, take into consideration the importance of reading as an educator, a lifelong learner, a mother, uh, you know, as somebody who taught a lot and teaches continuously Alaska Native education. Um, I have seen that it's very hard uh, to change the minds of adults, but if you can help educate the minds of children, then you can transform the future. And so although like in my lifetime, I've experienced a lot of difficulties and challenges between you know, racism, stereotypes, biases imposed on you know, people of color, my, including myself, uh, my family, my children, uh, I might not be able to change the adults. Hopefully I can through persuasion, the arts thereof, but um, education, I feel like, and experience are the key and how we educate is through reading and communicating again. Uh, it's, so, it's so powerful. We have um, a lot of questions I'd like to get to. And I just want to remind our audience uh, that if you thumbs up, the question and it's going to come to the top of my feed and then I'll see it and I'll know that that's the one that like a lot of people want to um, have answered. So the top one right now is about Roe versus Wade and it's talking about it has talked about it as being only related to abortion, but I've always believed that it is res a responsible it is responsible for women's rights to all kinds of medical services and information. For example, before Roe versus Wade, maternity insurance coverage was not available to single women. Could you speak to that, asked Sarah? Yes, and I'm gonna go a little bit out of my lane, Sarah, and you're gonna be, uh, uh, and if there are any lawyers you'd like to jump in, please do. <laughs> the problem with Roe is that it's about coverture. We have not been able to declare that women have full autonomy over themselves. We just haven't been able to do it. Just like John Adams couldn't do it, we couldn't do it. And because of that, we've had to assert rights for different women to do different kinds of things at different times by making other kinds of arguments. Uh, even people, I, and this is when I'm gonna speak like a lawyer and I look for lawyers, even people who support a woman's right to choose don't think Roe is great law because it's based on privacy, it's, 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 it's based on a reading, it would be, we wouldn't need it. It's a workaround. 
we just need to declare that women are people with <laughs> no rights over their bodies. What the founders were concerned with was sexual access. They did not want a woman to have control or autonomy over access. We're obsessed with this thing about controlling women's reproduction. That's our thing. But it comes down to, is this person um, a true spirit, uh, a being, uh, as Aristotle would say, an end in herself and not the means to someone else's end? Is this a person with a soul, some people would say, or with a destiny? We are just so reluctant to do that because we don't wanna give women that kind of unchecked power over themselves. We all know the dark sin of our history is slavery, but there are lessons we can take from that and lessons from the experience of those who have been enslaved, who by the way, have been very clear on this issue. If someone can control your body, if someone can send you out to work against your will, have sex with you against your will, make you have children or not have children. If someone has that power over you, you are not free. That's just the deal. Exactly. And enslaved people have always known that. Uh, and they're real clear on it. I would have to say uh, the failings I would say in our society is that many white women of the middling and upper classes who were fighting about suffrage, who are doing the club uh, women work, we're doing all kinds of things, less clear on that, less clear on that. And I think that should be one of the lessons of American history. And then we don't have to worry about is Roe based on privacy or is it based on a faulty this? And then what about insurance? We would have women as full and equal human beings and their votes and their political interests, once they knew that there was something that worthy, worthy to be won, would, would do all the things you'd want to do for the world. It is amazing how far back in history our lives are still affected today. And oh, yes. And American history is particularly short. It's about 15 minutes long. <laughs> yeah. Well, because, and I, and I should say because of coverture, and, and again, I only mention these things because I think it might be familiar to people, uh, because of coverture, well into the 1950s, if you were an American-born woman and you married outside the country to a man of a certain ethnicity, Chinese, for one, but not just the Chinese, you lost your citizenship. Wow. Marital rape wasn't a crime until the 1980s. Women weren't on juries until the 1960s. All of these are vestiges of coverture and they are within living memory. And again, I, I think I alluded to women who got divorced in the 60s and 70s who suddenly couldn't borrow money or buy a house or charge on a credit card. That is coverture. I think this is very, um, you know, just educational for, for everybody, men and women included. And I think about you know, friends that I've spoken with, women that are, you know, in my community that have had to have sex with their husbands without wanting to. Yes. And it is, it is so sad, you know, to put it mildly um, and to know that it is illegal and that it's, you know, tap, the illegalness started in the eighties. That's crazy. Like, yeah. what? <laughs> Let's advance ourselves, people. <laughs> oh, this, is, this, is why, this is why we study history because you know you or your friend experience it personally, which is very deep and, and I'm taking that very, but there's a structure around it. And once you see the structure, you go, oh, that's why. I mean, when we talk about difficulties with issues of consent, we have a lot of uh, difficulty in our culture dealing with the terrible crime of rape um, yes. at, at times where you think to yourself, what is unclear about this? Why is this uh, idea of a woman's consent so muddied? And it comes again from a culture that covered women in so many ways that their consent was implied, right? So yeah. John Locke is the famous revolutionary theorist. Uh, he was uh, the favorite of the founding because he was all against you know, tyranny and abuse of authority. And in his theory, every man, every man, should wake up every day and say, am I being ruled well and properly? And if the answer is no, you not only uh, can revolt against an, a, 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 a tyrannous ruler like a king, you should. And this was Locke's uh, revolutionary theory. And of course, you could see why the founders just ate it up with a, with a spoon. When it came to wives, he couldn't do it. 
he couldn't do it. He could not allow that women should wake up every day and look at their husbands and say, am I being properly ruled? And if <laughs> not, not only can I get rid of this guy, I, I, I have an obligation to it. And so how he got around that is he said, women have the power of consent. So this is all about consent. And the power of consent is once in their life. Once they consent to marry, all other consents are implied. And so the power of total power, mastery, legally now of this human being is now enshrined in the system. And I think there are people in our audience who remember a time when a man decided when a family would move, yeah. when it was time to go, to, to, to move somewhere. Um, so that all comes from this tradition. And you're right, it has long roots, Yerebe, mm -hmm. these long tentacles that we're feeling now. Yeah. It makes me think about the uh, alarming data around the missing and murdered indigenous women and you know, not seeing women for one as a person. And then you add on top of that indigenous identity and how it's been erased from a lot of teaching in you know, our education fields or just not included. And the fact that we are only, uh, as Indigenous people in this nation, about 2% of the total population and only have so much voice in order to say, hey, like a lot of our women are missing. Important. And yes, yeah. And I just think about the roots that it has going back to coverture and, and how it has impacted you know, generations of families and really devastated so many people. And I believe that we can really um, educate ourselves through programs like uh, Ask the Expert today with you and understanding how the history has influenced our psyche and um, makes us think weird things like, oh, it's okay to, you know, treat women a certain way or my wife a certain way because she's mine. Well, no, buddy. Like, <laughs> yeah, but then you're also pointing out the, the fungibility of women because we are crafted to be uh, a means to someone else's end, increases exponentially with race, with poverty. So women that are, um, as they go, as they move down the patriarchal structure, they become more and more disposable. Yeah. And that's true as well. <sighs> more disposable. It's just, I'm sorry. It just gets me all, I, this is such a great topic. It's, uh, you know, like lived reality for us. Right. Well, I have to also say though, in the last couple of minutes, I'm cheating, you know, um, I'm, I'm looking, I'm so inspired by the kinds of Please. questions that people are, are asking in the statements yes. as well. And I hope everybody's getting a chance to see these because really what an engaged group. I'm proud to be a member of this group. Yes, it is amazing. And I don't mean women, I mean GBH. <laughs> Aw, that's so great. Is there one in particular that is speaking out that you'd like um, to answer? I'm looking at the one um, that's second in line from uh, Sarah Kirk. And she's oh, yeah. asking, can you speak about the intersectionality and in women's history? Also, the yeah. fact that even women, when women's rights laws began to be passed, it was white women who benefited from the new freedoms. Yeah, I uh, think this is great. That was the one I picked, too, because it brings in, a, again, we're learning vocabulary, intersectionality. And it really is, um, it's, it's a new, I think it's a fairly new word for most people, but it's an old idea. And it was most, um, I think, best described more poetically than I'll be able to do by W.E.B. Du Bois. And he talked about um, the experience of being a man and a black man living in a society. And intersectionality is really the confluence of where in a, like in a person, the things that you're talking about come together, who you are in the gender spectrum, um, what is your uh, race or ethnicity or whatever we're gonna call it. Um, and how do those things influence your um, your position in the power structure. And the great example is African-American women. So um, enslaved people are, are free. That's great. Uh, they're freed, everybody's freed, uh, but men go on to at least aspire, and again, legally not, to a certain set of rights, but black women don't get those rights because white women don't have those rights, right? And so, uh, and again, the, the, like we look at groups of people who have a lot of wisdom, 
a lot of African American women came out of slavery, Black women, and they said, "What the you know, basically, what the heck is this? I'm I'm being told now I need to be subordinate to my husband. I don't get to vote. I don't get to I get to basically be owned by him rather than someone else." Um, and so it's in those moments of intersectionality where it's an uh, it's an actor that we see that isn't like a standard white middle class woman that we see the deep fissures in the system. So. That's a short answer to a very deep question, but thank you so much for asking it. Yeah, thank you so much, Catherine. I feel like we could go on for hours and uh, we are out of time. It, this has gone by so quickly. I just wanted to thank everybody for putting up your questions and uh, please go, go ahead and visit Catherine's social links if you're interested in actually like getting the answers to your questions um, fulfilled today. I apologize we weren't able to get to everybody's questions, but I'm so grateful that we had uh, this rich conversation, Catherine, and thank it just so brought much. up so much, so much for me. So thank you. I'm just looking at one of the final questions. I'm so happy to have been both infuriating and informative. <laughs> thank you, everybody. <laughs> yes, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Take happy care. Happy Women's History Month. Yes, thank you so much.